when we talk about how open source uh, drives innovation, it's often seen as something very new or novel. Um, so I have a little bit of perspective to start off this block uh, around how it's actually not all that new and novel. In many ways, it's, it's baked right into the, the very nature of software. Um, so uh, the author, William Gibson, uh, had a, a quote that he was fond of repeating around the turn of this, this century. Uh, that's, um, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. Um, and when you look back over the history of software, you can kind of see how open source driving innovation was always going to happen. Uh, I have a bit of an analogy from uh, the, world of, the world of physics that kind of helps illustrate uh, this history. So uh, when an object makes a noise, um, it, it sends out a sound wave. It's like a regular ripple, and it actually looks, it looks a bit like uh, when you drop a pebble in a pond, and you can kind of see the, the rings spreading out, so it's a very regular pattern. Uh, and, and by analogy, this is like the early days of software, like the 40s to the 60s and 70s, uh, where software wasn't actually copyrightable at all. Uh, people only saw economic value in the hardware, and so software was all freely available. Um, so, the analogy, when an object starts traveling, those sound waves that it makes, they kind of bunch up, and you start to see um, this, this sort of like uh, conglomeration of sound on one side in the direction that it's traveling. Um, so this is like the 70s, when people started talking about software being copyrightable. Um, and Bill Gates sent out his letter accusing the, the software sharing community of, of breaking the law, but in fact, at that point, it was still perfectly legal to use, modify, and redistribute any software you encountered. So he was wrong. Um, so the next bit, as you travel faster, um, when an object hits exactly the speed of sound, all those sound waves that are traveling, that it created behind it, catch up exactly with the object, and they make this massively like, disruptive zone uh, of sound right around the object as it travels. Uh, this was called the sound barrier, and pilots actually died trying to break the sound barrier. Uh, people believed that it was impossible to travel faster than the speed of sound. Um, so this corresponds to the 80s. Um, the 80s is when software copyright was introduced. Uh, this is when you see big companies like Apple and Oracle um, and uh, Microsoft launching into the fore based on copyright licensing, building these big businesses around uh, software licensing. Um, so you have this disruptive edge, which is where proprietary business models are possible. That's the, the disruptive sound barrier. Um, and, and disruption is the only way that proprietary models succeed. But even at that time, even in the 80s, um, you had this body of open source software. It wasn't called open source then, but there was this body of software, including BSD, and then slowly we began to introduce more things like the GNU project, and then Perl, and then um, you know, the variety of, of projects that grew up even all the way back then. Um, so there was this big body of software that was open source, and yet, there was a belief, there was a, I would even call it a delusion, that, um, that proprietary software would always lead innovation. Um, that it was impossible, that it was only proprietary software that could have that disruptive leading quality to it. So here's the secret about the sound barrier. The sound barrier doesn't actually exist at all. It's an illusion. Um, it's, there, there are a, a collection of transition effects between traveling at subsonic speeds and traveling at supersonic speeds. And those transition effects give the impression of this massive disruption, of this barrier that you cannot cross. But in fact, with a little bit of technology shift, um, we now cross the sound barrier, barrier regularly without any difficulty at all. Um, it was just a matter of, of learning the innovative techniques necessary to cross the sound barrier. So this corresponds to the period. Uh, from the 80s to the 90s, you had a growing body of open source software, um, typically called free software at that time and still called free software today. Um, around the year 2000, there was a shift. 
And it was driven by the introduction of projects like uh, Debian and the Linux kernel and MySQL and Apache and Python and PHP and Perl, and all these projects that came through in the 80s and 90s. But the shift around the year 2000 was instead of having these be seen as sort of copycats, they were lagging behind the body of proprietary software. The shift was to uh, the leading edge of software innovation in Silicon Valley and elsewhere was now suddenly built on open source software. Um, there's some reasons behind that. Uh, part of it was that the software had to get to a level of maturity where it was completely usable in production. Um, part of it was just uh, uh, a growing acceptance that this, this software had been around a while and people trusted it. Part of it was also the economic crash around the year 2000. Suddenly, um, startups couldn't afford to pay for an Oracle license and a Microsoft license and a, um, like, the, in the constrained economy, they really had to start looking at alternatives. So at that point, there was a big shift, and Web 2.0 was built entirely on the backs of, on the back of open source projects. Um, it, there, was, there was still a period of transition, so you can look back and you can see, well, that was the transition point. That was the point that we crossed the sound barrier. Um, but then there was a continued growth over time. So as you accelerate faster and faster, it gets easier and easier. Um, for the farther you get from the sound barrier, the less disruptive it is. Um, so through 2000 to 2005, you see more and more companies kind of like beginning to use open source and beginning to see it as a source of innovation. Um, 2005 to 2010 was a big uh, sort of chain of adoption to the point that in 2010, um, a lot of people announced that open source won. Uh, because open source was launched in about two, you know, a little before 2000 with the idea that we needed to help explain uh, the concepts of free software to companies. So in 2010, it was like, well, the companies are here. That's great. Uh, we won. And then a very interesting thing happened. It kept growing. Uh, so a survey in 2010 uh, showed about 48% of companies using open source. The same survey was repeated in 2015, and it showed 78% com of companies using open source. 64% contributing to it, and 88% saying that they were planning to contribute more in the future. Um, so w without any great intervention by any particular body or any particular group of people, this, this idea of open source software just kept growing and growing and growing, and it continues to accelerate. So there's a law of economic necessity here that drives a good bit of this. And that is, if you are in a position where all of your competitors are using this great body of open innovation, if you're not, then you're left behind. Then you're the one who's putting out all this money to get software licenses when all of your competitors are building on open innovation. And then the next step is, it suddenly becomes table stakes just to get in the game. If you want to be in the game of technology today and you're not willing to use open source software, you are at a, 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 a massive disadvantage from the starting gate. Um, you can't even really get in yet if you're not using it. I, it's hard to find any company that isn't at least using some open source software. And if they tell you they aren't, go ask their sysadmins because it's likely that they really are and they just don't know it yet. So the next step beyond that, and this is kind of where we're heading uh, 2010, 2015, and then beyond, is once it's table stakes to get in the game, if using open source is just the bare minimum to enter, then you suddenly have to start looking for the new competitive edge, and the new competitive edge is participation. So if a company is just using open source, they're not getting the full benefits from it. If they're willing to participate and contribute their changes back, then they get their bugs fixed faster. They get the features they need out of those open source projects faster. Um, they get more of the complete benefit of open source. So this is how, it, this is how open source drives innovation, and this is also why it keeps accelerating faster and faster and faster. Um, 
the more that large cone of open source software is out there, the more you can build any, just about any platform you want on open source software, the more compelling it becomes to use it, the more everyone has to use it, and the more it also drives more companies to participate in building it, and the more companies who participate in building it, the faster the development goes, and so it continues in this sort of like virtuous cycle of growing and growing and growing. So this is in some ways just an observation of the past of the history. Um, I don't tend to be content to just sit and observe, and I think the way, one of the ways we help enable this trend to continue is elevating awareness of it so that the companies understand how they've gotten where they are and why open source innovation is not some strange, fringy thing. It is, in fact, uh, essentially the way most innovation is going to be driven in the future. Um, it, it enables companies to collaborate in ways that they couldn't do behind commercial agreements uh, because the open source licensing and the open source contribution agreements just make it so much easier for them. They don't have to spend like five years negotiating a patent agreement in order to collaborate on a piece of work. Um, they just go to the established open source project with the established open source foundation. Um, and the terms are already set up for them to, to collaborate more easily. And collaboration is a key part of driving innovation because in one company you'll have like 5% of the ideas you need, another company will have 10% of the ideas you need, but if you really want to get to the next level of, of technological progress, you need all of those ideas combined, and locking them off in silos actually slows down the pace of, of, of technology innovation. <clears throat> 